she recently came out to see with us for uh, the month of January, escaped the cold weather in uh, Washington for a bit, in the uh, yeah, eastern tropical Pacific with us, uh, where she worked tirelessly measuring critical oxygen levels in marine animals. Um, Allison got a bachelor's degree from Duke University back in 2001 and a master's from UCLA in 2005. She did her PhD at the University of South Carolina with Brian Helmut studying uh, intertidal muscle physiology. So she has a legitimate uh, physiology and biology background before she went to the dark side and started modeling with uh, Jorge Sarmiento for her postdoctoral, uh, first postdoctoral stint. Um, she was at Princeton from 2010 to 2013. Since then, she has been a researcher at the eScience Institute at uh, University of Washington School of Oceanography. This is funded by uh, the Research Foundation Innovation and Moore Sloan Postdoctoral Fellowships in Data Science. Her advisors there are Curtis Deutsch and Jeff Hare. So today she will be talking to you about projections of climate-driven changes on blood oxygen affinity in pelagic habitat. Hi. Take it over. Hi. Excited to be here. It's nice and sunny. <laughs> it's been a while since I've seen the sun. Um, yeah, um, so I just want to point out before I start, I actually publish under a different name. My last name's Smith, so I publish under my grandmother's name. Um, so if you want to find my papers, um, this is where what you need to put in the search field. Uh, so I'm interested in a really basic ecological question in, um, that's been we've been trying to answer since um, the beginning of ecology in terms of what determines where animals live. Um, and in particular, I'm interested in the ocean. Um, and so my approach to doing this is I really um, think to make you know, progress from where we are now, what we really need to do is start crossing across um, levels of biological organization. So oftentimes in biology, we focus in on um, one of these boxes, whether it be cell, protein, organism, population, or community, and we really focus in on that box, but we don't really think as much about the other boxes or maybe just one of them. Um, and I think trying to cross across all these different boxes is really um, important um, for really understanding um, um, where, what is determining where animals live. Um, and the other thing I try to do um, in terms of my um, methodology is, um, so oftentimes we end up looking at um, one location, especially in biology, um, but also um, in other things. But we intently look at one location, we find out a lot about that one location, um, and so we know a lot about what's happening in that system, but um, climate change is affecting larger areas, so understanding not only what's happening in one location, but being able to understand those mechanisms well enough to be, make predictions over much larger areas. So that's um, another thing I try to do. And then um, also looking through time, um, a course of a PhD or even a master's is a pretty short period of time, so you're looking really intensely over a short period of time, but you can't be there all the time forever. Um, and so understanding, um, once again, mechanisms are well enough to be able to look back in time and look forward in time and really understand um, what's going on um, in our marine systems. Um, so I've worked in a lot of different systems. So as Brad said, I um, started out, I worked in the marine um, rocky intertidal. Um, I've done um, estuarine work. I've also worked on um, bacteria in the ocean water column. So I, I'm really trying to um, look at, at, you know, use that approach across a bunch of different um, uh, 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 different um, organisms and types of uh, systems. Um, but today I'm going to be talking about hypoxia tolerance in the pelagic ocean. Um, and so uh, just to give a brief overview of um, the distribution of oxygen in the ocean. Um, so uh, this is showing oxygen at 500 meters depth. And uh, what this shows is that most areas have, um, so this is oxygen in kilopascals, which is a oxygen units. Um, we have lots of them. <laughs> and everyone seems to have a different favorite oxygen unit. Uh, my favorite oxygen unit is uh, kilopascals. Um, and so for the most part, I'll be showing um, results, at least from my research, in kilopascals. But you might see I have graphs from other studies that are actually in different units. And so you know, definitely a few other oxygen-based units will be popping up. Um, but anyway, so this is in kilopascals. Um, and what this, so yellow indicates that um, uh, oxygen levels are really high um, um, relative to the darker blue, which is where oxygen levels are closer to zero. Um, and so throughout most of the Eastern Pacific, um, at 500 meters depth, the oxygen levels are, um, are really low, um, and that extends into the North Pacific, and then over here um, in the Arabian Sea in the Bay of Bengal. 
Uh, and so, and over here, um, off the coast of Africa, um, oxygen levels are also lower. Uh, and so, uh, in terms of oxygen, um, I also often talk to diverse audiences, so I like to sort of compare it to sort of our frame of reference. And so on land, we just sort of take oxygen for granted. It's everywhere, we have enough of it, um, <laughs> we can breathe, and it's only if you start climbing up a mountain, a really high mountaineering and higher altitudes that you're suddenly um, experiencing the lack of, you know, lower pressures of oxygen and you actually feel um, the effects of, of lower oxygen. Um, and then also going in, in, also in land, if you're a land biologist, the uh, other comparison would be um, if um, you're going deeper in soil and soil gets anoxic um, as microbes use up the oxygen in the soil. But um, compared to the land, ocean has um, low oxygen in really large areas, it's persistent, um, it's there all the time, um, and uh, so that's sort of an important frame of reference. Um, and so just, the ocean is 3D, um, and so uh, just showing how oxygen looks across a transect in the Pacific. Uh, so this is showing uh, uh, the low, so this is um, in the tropical region, um, oxygen levels are low in the sort of mid-water region um, between 200 and 1,000 meters depth. Um, but it's not true everywhere, but um, here in the tropical um, region between negative 20 and 20 and then up into the northern regions. Um, and so oxygen is higher at the surface um, where oxygen enters the ocean is absorbed from the surface or produces a byproduct of photosynthesis. Um, and, uh, um, and then... Uh, it's utilized in this region by bacteria, which are um, uh, utilizing oxygen as they decompose organic matter. Um, and so they use up all the oxygen really quick. Um, but all that organic matter is used up, and eventually, as the organic matter gets deeper, um, well, it's all been used up, and so the bacteria don't have as much organic matter, so they don't use as much of the oxygen. Um, and then, depending on what the supply rates of oxygen from the surface are, determines where these, uh, uh, and the ocean circulation patterns determine where these low oxygen um, areas develop. Um, and so um, this, there was a, a hypothesis that's been developed that, um, and there's been observations that these oxygen, um, areas with low oxygen are uh, increasing um, in size. Uh, and so I adapted this from one of Brad's papers uh, um, in terms of showing um, basically what's predicted is that you have all the habitat here um, and uh, this epoxic region here, and in the future, um, this area is going to get shallower, so it's going to compress this habitat above it and deeper. Uh, and so, uh, since most of the biomass is um, up here, um, that, that is going to compress it uh, in the future, um, or even is compressing it now. Um, and that could have really big impacts on um, interactions between species in terms of competition um, and predator-prey interactions. Um, animals that used to be going to certain depths may not be going to those depths anymore. Um, and so this could have really big consequences for the marine ecosystem. Um, so I'm going to talk about three um, different uh, uh, um, three different parts to my talk today. Um, first, I'm going to describe the method that I'm going to use um, for looking at whether this habitat compression, uh, or looking at for habitat compression, and whether or not it's going to occur. Um, then I'm going to sort of apply it across a bunch of different diverse animals, and then. Um, I'm going to make specific projections using climate model results um, for tuna uh, in the global ocean. So just starting with the first uh, uh, part. Um, so this is showing uh, critical oxygen, um, this is critical oxygen pressure. So it turns out um, determining an epoxy threshold for a uh, marine animal um, is, uh, there's lots of options for it and um, they all have positives and negatives and so um, when I started looking into this question, um, it was sort of like, you know, which measure should I be using? Um, and so critical oxygen pressure is one of the first ones I looked at, and it's um, uh, a really great one um, for looking at hypoxia tolerance. Uh, and so what um, critical oxygen pressure is, so this is showing um, the different, so you have routine and basal metabolism here, um, and then maximum metabolism up here. And so the critical oxygen pressure is the point at which um, uh, routine metabolism, metabolism can no longer be maintained um, based on, uh, for the oxygen consumption rate. And so, uh, and so this is a really um, specifically defined point, um, which is really great, and it shows where animals are no longer able to just sit there, not do anything, um, and still be not getting enough oxygen to maintain um, their routine metabolic rate. 
Uh, and so how this is measured is uh, uh, an animal is put in a sealed aquarium um, and either through some sort of uh, uh, controller, oxygen is removed or um, either or the animal is allowed to just remove oxygen by respiring. Um, and eventually it reaches that point and you can actually determine where the peak crit is. Um, and but not every animal will sit in this aquarium. Um, but uh, um, so um, it does limit the types of animals that you could actually measure. Um, but when I was on the cruise with Brad and his research group, we were making these measurements. Um, and so this is um, everyone deploying the trawl. Uh, and then um, here's a krill um, in a respiration chamber. Um, so we, you know, on the cruise, we actually managed to get a lot more critical oxygen uh, measurements. Um, and when I first started the study, um, I was really limited in the number of critical oxygen measurements to get, particularly with multiple temperatures measured. Um, and so um, on this, it was really cool because going on this cruise, we actually got um, a lot new, many new measurements that I could you know, that could be used to make assessments of this um, question. Um, and so, um, but there's another uh, method for um, looking at hypoxia um, tolerances in animals, and that's looking at the blood oxygen or the oxygen affinity of blood, um, and that's what I'm going to be mostly focusing on today. Um, and so, what the oxygen, how oxygen affinity of blood is measured is, um, so this is PO2 in the blood, and this is the percent oxygenation of the blood pigment. Um, and so, uh, what's used for comparison um, for oxygen affinity is this um, value called the P50. And so that's the oxygen pressure in the blood at which the blood is 50% oxygenated. Uh, and so the lower this P50 is, that means the blood pigments have a greater affinity for oxygen, um, and that animal would be more hypoxia tolerant. However, if a P50 is higher, um, it has a lower, it's considered having a lower oxygen affinity, um, and that animal would be less hypoxia tolerant. Um, however, there's a trade-off here. Uh, and so um, so the O2 is going into the gills and being absorbed, and so that's what we're looking at um, in the previous slide in terms of thinking about hypoxia tolerances. In the ocean where oxygen is really low, this, sort of pro this process where the O2 is moving into the gills is really um, critical. Um, however, there's a trade-off in that if oxygen is binding really well in the gills, and you know, it circulates through the animal, um, and uh, the blood pigments get here, and they need to deliver that oxygen to the muscles or other organs that need it, um, and if the animal does something heavily exercising and, and it really needs um, oxygen delivered to the muscles um, for like first swimming really fast, um, there might be a trade-off between how well it binds versus how well it's quickly delivered um, to the places where it's needed. Um, so there is this trade-off um, in terms of um, the, you know, not, that's why not everything might be, you know, bind at really low oxygen levels is because um, perhaps they have other adaptations that um, need oxygen um, delivered really quickly. Um, so P crit um, and P50 are uh, linked together. Um, and so what, this is a really nice study um, by Mandic et al. in 2019. And what they did during the study is they went out and they found uh, sculpins from a bunch of different habitats. So they were closely related um, and uh, brought them back and then, then measured a whole bunch of both P50 and P crit and gill surface area and a whole bunch of measures on these animals. And what they did was they tried to figure out what was a good predictor of P crit? Um, and so by uh, doing this, what they found was actually P50 was the best predictor of P crit. Um, and gill surface area is also important, and, and, but some of the other um, measures that they did um, weren't as good of a predictor, or almost didn't really predict it at all. Um, so there is a really good connection. So this is actually why the study, when I found it, was actually why I started looking into P50 as a predictor of P crit. Um, uh, was because there seems to be this really close connection between the two measurements. Um, and so, and some of the other th work we're doing is trying to figure out exactly how one can be predicted from the other. Um, so blood oxygen binding is al also affected by temperature. Uh, and so uh, this is just showing the reaction between a blood pigment such as uh, hemoglobin, um, HB stands for hemoglobin, and, and oxygen. And in terms of a chemical reaction, um, as, a, as a result, heat is produced um, as a result of the reaction. Um, in this case, um, the reaction is exothermic, and um, blood oxygen binding would be favored under cooler conditions um, in sort of chemistry terms. And then, oops, 
For other species, um, heat is actually on the other side of the reaction. So you add in heat here, um, and um, it's actually required for the reaction to occur. Um, in these cases, blood action binding may be favored under warmer conditions. So this is showing that uh, it really depends on, on whether an animal is um, exothermic or endothermic about how well, you know, as it's moving around in an environment with different temperatures, um, how that's, that, that binding is going to be affected um, at the gill. Um, so this is just showing this um, moving from warmer to cooler temperatures, so how the P50 shifts. Um, so with, it, with the action, reaction being exothermic, the P50 shifts lower, and that oxygen um, binding reaction, that they're going to have a greater affinity for oxygen. So if an animal spends from warmer to cooler water, if that water, cooler water is lower in oxygen, they'll bind oxygen better. However, in the case of a blood oxygen binding back reaction that's endothermic, the opposite happens. If they swim into cooler water, that P50 shifts higher, that decreases oxygen affinity um, and makes it less hypoxia tolerant. Um, and so I, um, for heat of oxygenation, I've been using calculations of apparent heat of oxygenation, which are calculated using the Van Hoff equation. Um, and so if you, cal if you measure P50 at two different temperatures, um, you can, can, can calculate what this apparent heat of oxygenation is. Um, and that's what I've been using um, um, as a calculation for that. So next I'm going to talk about the fundamental niches of blood oxygen bindings. This is looking at a bunch of different animals. Um, there's two blood pigments. So I've mentioned hemoglobin before, um, but there's also hemocyanin. So hemoglobin is found in most vertebrates um, or in vertebrates. Um, hemocyanin is found um, uh, in a lot of invertebrates, but that's not exclusive. There's exceptions. Um, in terms of there's, he there's some invertebrates which have hemoglobin. Um, and so what I did was I then went to the literature uh, and looked for as many measurements of blood oxygen binding. I was in a modeling group. We don't have the ability to make measurements um, where I was, so I was very dependent on the literature, which you know, at some point I was like, oh, I want, really want this animal, you know, measurements for this animal, and they wouldn't have it. So anyway, <laughs> um, so in this case, um, I went to the literature and I found as many marine benthic and pelagic animals as I could where they had measurements of blood oxygen binding at more than one temperature. Um, and so, and then I was comparing to see how much difference there were between different animals. Um, and so, um, what I found, so this is showing all, I found about a little more than 50 animals um, where these measurements had been made. Uh, and so, um, and this is showing all the different animals I found, and so this is P50, and this is the heat that's um, either absorbed or released um, as the reaction occurs. Um, and so most animals are down here in this quadrant. Um, but it's really hard with all these numbers here. You don't know what these animals are. Um, and in the paper that I wrote on this, you have to go look at the table. Um, and so what I did when I actually was writing the paper was just, and I'm, I'm working with a computer scientist, so one of my um, advisors is Jeff Hare. Um, he's a developed software to make interactive graphs as part of his work. Um, and so I was familiar with this ability to make interactive graphs. And I was like, this seems like a perfect subject for an interactive graph. We can actually, and I'm going to show you the interactive graph that I made. Um, so let's see, I've got to get a cursor over here. Oh, there we go. Um, so what I did was I used a JavaScript library called D3, which stands for Data Driven Documents. Uh, and so, and what I did was took all the information that I found um, from uh, my literature searches and um, put them in the graph. Um, and so what the nice thing is, is if, we hover, if, if I hover over one of these points, um, it shows the species, it shows the common name, the species name, and um, the reference um, where I found that species, um, the measurements. Um, so you can get that information a lot easier than you could in just a static graph um, where you have to go look up everything on a table somewhere. Um, and so, and here, um, and also I could add additional information about whether this was an animal from a benthic or pelagic habitat. Um, I could also add information about um, whether it's a hemoglobin or a hemocyanin, um, and whether it was a vertebrate or an invertebrate, um, whether it's a vertical migrator or not. Yeah? Can you just say that one time, what's the delta H again? So delta H is that heat that's either absorbed or released, yeah. On this one, I changed it on all my slides, but on the interactive graph, this is actually what I published. Um, so I had it as delta H in that paper. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, so this is the, yeah, so you can get a lot more information on this interactive graph um, than you could just from the static. 
Um, so they're, you know, working with computer scientists has, you know, some advantages when you find out about these cool new tools that are available. Um, so moving back to sort of the science side, um, so what can we determine from looking at this graph? And so I'm going to switch it to the pigment. Um, and so what I found was there were these outliers out here. Um, uh, so they tend to be, and they tend to be the pelagic animals, so krill and squid. Um, so this is a krill here. Um, this is a squid. Um, here's another squid here. That's one Brad measured. <laughs> um, there's another krill up here. Um, and so these animals that were real outliers on the graph actually were the pelagic animals. So that I thought was a really interesting and made this worth investigating further. Um, also, um, there's tuna and tuna. So this is a zero line. So this is up here means heat um, is absorbed during the reaction. So this is endothermic. Um, above zero, and this is exothermic below zero. Um, and so tuna um, tended to have um, blood oxygen binding reactions that were both endothermic and exothermic. Um, so this is um, the big eye tuna down here, and this is the southern bluefin tuna up there. So even species that are pretty closely related um, actually had very different um, blood oxygen binding characteristics. All right, so moving back to the slideshow. Um, so just to summarize what I was showing you in the previous plot, um, so you have krill and squid that are these outliers, and then tuna, which have blood oxygen binding reactions that are both endothermic and exothermic. Um, and so, and if you want to find this online, um, I, I published it as, there's a link in the paper, and um, this is a link that um, you can actually go and play with the interactive graph. Um, so for the next set, um, instead of looking at specific organisms, I took a, sort of a characteristic physiological type from each of these quadrants. Um, and so this is a low P50. And so a lot of advice I've been given when I've given this talk is, you know, attach it to an animal because that this is a lot easier for everyone to like process. But the problem is, is it represents a lot of different animals, and I wouldn't want to give a particular um, animal like make it seem like it was only that animal. So you're gonna. I'm going to be tongue twistering talking about it. So I'll be like low P50 blood oxygen binding reaction that's exothermic, blood below high P50 blood oxygen binding reaction that's exothermic, and low P50 blood oxygen binding reaction that's endothermic. Um, so anyway, so it is a big tongue twister. Um, but what I did is I um, will show which one is the most animals um, in all the slides. So 